All right, welcome everybody to the third lecture for uh, History Report 68, Pacific Northwest. Um, today we're exploring the history of Seattle. Um, with it, we'll be discussing its physical development um, in an urban sense, but also how uh, the resources and the environmental changes in the region outside the city, uh, known as its hinterlands, um, were key to the city's development. And these are typically told as two separate stories. Um, you have urban change, urban development told as one story and all of the other necessary changes in the rural parts of the territory uh, in order to make that urban development possible. Those two things are not connected in people's minds, both at the time but also in the way we talk about it uh, at present. Um, and this is kind of emblematic of the differences between um, within the discipline of history, um, the differences between urban history as a methodology and environmental history as a methodology. And it's not anything necessarily new, but I would say in the last few decades, urban environmental history, which is kind of like, it is what it sounds like. It's a blend of the two um has really made a concerted effort to um blur those lines uh, methodologically and, and to show that urban development um is predicated on either resource um extraction or in our case uh development for railroads um that these are all necessary uh rural changes for the urban landscape and we should that for our purposes today in discussing uh seattle that's what we'll be we'll be talking about um and we'll be keeping in line with our overarching story of uh settler colonialism in uh the pacific northwest as our our story of the history of the pacific northwest and uh, I did have to combine, I, think I, I mentioned to everybody, I combined um, and scrapped some of the lecture material, which is unfortunate, but like I said in the in the message, um, that, that was actually my original point in the class, uh, was telling a story, uh, you necessarily have to pick and choose, and just had too little time and too much to talk about, so um, we're going to, we're going to be putting our story today uh, in in the same realm of the overarching settler colonial history of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and our questions for today uh, that we really need to ask in order to like fully explain the context or the, the development of, of Seattle in this context. Um, we need to ask some some questions about our historical thinking uh you know or our approach to this as well as about the history itself so number one how did how and why did seattle grow to be the biggest city in the northwest i think that's more of a general history how did this happen right how did seattle become this humongous city as we know it now and as it was or ha as it has been for a long time what were the effects on native people? And importantly, you know, how do native people experience living in urban Seattle in the early 20th century? Um, this is important because we're talking, we're going to be talking in a moment about um, the end of the 19th century and the so-called closing of the frontier and how in history um, at this point, Native people just kind of drop off or drop out of the story uh, as far as the way that we tell it um, at, at present. The history of the 20th century, especially in the early 20th century, after the so-called closing the frontier, um, Native people are, are left out of, of accounts of history. Um, and uh, we're one for the rest of this course, uh, our main sort of theme is that no, Native people are very much still uh, 
present and active and fighting to uh, regain sovereignty over their ancestral homelands and their right to self-determination. Um, and so basically, you know, that's just to say that we're going to highlight um, the fact that in that we're actively going against a historical narrative, but we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a moment here with the closing of the frontier. Um, but that is to say that we need to look at how Native people experienced living in urban Seattle in the early 20th century. And more of a methodological question that I was outlining, how should we understand the relationship between urban development and rural environmental change? Uh, so last week, uh, everyone read Brown's City is More Than Human. Um, you know, the one point I, I, I really liked from Brown uh, is how animals are sorted into categories. Um, this is something that he meant, he talks about it early on. You know, there's wild, there's the categories of wild animals, which are predators mostly, um, wolves, mountain lions, bears, etc. And then there's the category of domestic or, or even further of livestock. And wild denotes, like I said, predators, but it, it really, what, what is it, what does that really signify? What do these categories actually mean? If we think about um, the existence of, of there's a, there's a, 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 a binary there between this type of animal and this type of animal, you know? Um, and what does that denote? For settlers, wild denoted uh, predators that were just killing livestock, right? And what's the point of that? It's that these are the animals that were undermining settler society's existence. Uh, wolves and mountain lions, whatever, and predators that were hunt that were killing cattle um, were wild and uncontrollable, right? Um, and they were undermining the reproduction of, of settler life. Uh, but domestic, on the other hand, as, as far as Brown is concerned, says um, that domestic denotes that it's in service to humans and just dependent on them economically. Um, and I think, and maybe not even, I mean, maybe that's a, a very like material way to, to look at that. But like, I think, you know, because you could say like, well, your dog is domestic and, and he talks about, you know, the, the domestication of pets in that book as well, which is really interesting. Um, but the point is, is that they're subservient, right? And I think that's more of the, the point that he's making there. Um, and the the broader point, though, that I really think is important, and it to, goes into what we've been talking about this entire course, uh, is that is the logic of settler colonialism. And again, it I make this point uh, consistently that settler colonialism and you know the the profit motive, the the logic of accumulation under capitalism. Uh, bend the world both materially in a, in a physical environmental sense but also ideologically to fit those molds and i think that this is another one of those instances where it's the, this dichotomy so the, the natural world is being reshaped or recategorized to fit this logic of accumulation that like certain animals are 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 uh now hereby uh here forth you know, like fundamentally, categorically different. And the important point there is that they're afforded different inherent rights and looked at as 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 a, their essence is different. Um, and, you know, that really contrasted, I think that Brown makes this point too, is that he it really contrasted with Salish beliefs that recognize the spiritual significance of animal life uh both in an active day-to-day -day sense and but also their their historical role within 
um, within the tribe as far as uh, their overall significance and their dependence on uh, upon these creatures. And one point that I'm also uh, cautious about is the one that I've made about disting making some sort of uh, distinguishment between European society and native society. Like, am I just reproducing, in saying this, am I just reproducing the same dichotomy or binary that assumes some sort of fundamental difference between indigenous people and Europeans, you know, that they weren't modern or that they like, that they had some sort of like, they were living in perfect. Am I just doing the whole, they're living in perfect harmony with the environment thing as far as the relationship with animals is concerned? I, I don't think so. I think that's good to think about. If, if that's what you're thinking at home, nice job. That's not as how we should be thinking about this. But I think to highlight this is more just to acknowledge the degree to which the natural world is um, abstracted under uh under settler logic or the logic of accumulation or whatever you want to call it um i i think it's more to say that like not that it's not abstracted in native life i mean that relationship as and the spiritual significance that is attached to animals it is itself abstract by definition but it's to say that like the degree to which those things are so um, made to be so different from one another when native people uh, in the, in the region understood animal life as being sort of interconnected um, in a, in a less like reductive use of the word. It all significant and all like inherently valuable. And I think to highlight these the differences in the in the cultural attitudes there is more just to showcase how morphed um, the or how much the logic of accumulation or logic of settler colonialism morphs relationships, human relationships with with the natural world and with other beings. It, it's uh, I think that that point in Brown was super, super significant. Um, and, you know, as you read too, uh, you know, native people strategically resisted settler colonialism through killing and stealing cattle, as we saw, uh, in that, uh, uh picture. Um, and especially in the, in, as Brown talks about in the, uh, the Hudson Bay company efforts, um, in the early 18th century, uh, or early 19th century, uh, rather, um, and cattle uh, as well uh, were, as Brown mentions, were not just a source of economic viability and material viability for settlers, but they were also, uh, their labor was used for uh, the development of, of the city. As you can see there in that picture, you have oxen uh, pulling logs uh, after uh, I mean, and you can see sort of the size of them um, right here, whereas there's a guy right there. And I mean, that's a pretty, this is pretty big trees, right? Um, this is very early on, but again, their, their labor, the labor of these animals made um, deforesting operations much more, uh, and same with horses, um, made them much more um speedy and and took the labor away basically just took the the that necessarily necessary labor away um from humans to have to do um and he makes the point that and what's the significance of that like well i mean okay so animals are what's the point so they you know people interact with animals uh as the city develops and i think with with the major point here is in a historiographical sense, like what's the point of emphasizing animal role? It's to more rethink what I was just mentioning about that settler like dichotomy of wild versus domestic. It's to problematize all of that. 
and to rethink uh, our dependence or reliance on animals, number one, but also to rethink uh, the way we ideologically relate to them and the, the de- how we attribute varying degrees of significance or intrinsic value, like whether that's lives, I mean, you can think about that in a modern sense, you know, whatever, whatever your personal beliefs are, but you could think about that in, in a modern sense, as far as livestock, you know, why, why you get to, why it's okay societally to kill and eat certain animals, but not others, right? I mean, you, you, or why certain animals get uh, inherently just uh, attributed with uh, this category of their their well their livestock so that's just what happens to them right I think um there's there's a lot of different um takeaways from rethinking how animals have reshaped human history and animal studies and animal history are like a really um growing I think that the the, the their importance to environmental history just more broadly is growing pretty rapidly um at the there was an environmental history conference in i think it was 2022 like may um that i went to it was actually here in eugene which was nice it was at the graduate hotel and so many of the panels were about um were like were about animal history or about animal studies and I think it's like a really it's it's the way that the field is going, I think, is just really like emphasizing uh, the degree to which the way like the way in which we re- relate to other animals um, determines how we just obviously treat them, but how we relate to nature as a as a as a whole. Um, I think that those are uh, really important questions. Um, and obviously not just to mention the contemporary sort of like more philosophical value of that, but like just historical value, um, understanding the degree to which cattle were, were an economic, to, you know, source of, of viability for, for settlers, how just how dependent they were on cattle, um, cannot be emphasized enough. And again, when we'll talk about, Klamath at the at the present tense, but we saw in the documentary that um, that cattle are still at the center of these conversations about the legacies of, of settler colonial uh, history. And um, this book, uh, Cattle Colonialism by John Ryan Fisher, is one of the um, more prominent works that has uh, um, paved the way of this for this field, uh, and he sort of emphasizes um again all of what i just mentioned the the degree to which settlers transformed the landscape to accommodate cattle uh how they ideologically related to them um how much the cattle uh replacing the uh well number one killing predators off to accommodate you know cattle also ecological uh consequences for the region um and uh as well as just for flora as well you know you have cattle that are grazing you have they um areas that are deforested to um make room for pastures things along those lines very environmentally uh consequential just transformational landscape overall and um a way that both um settlers and of course as we mentioned with native people killing off and and stealing cattle but but deliberately i think the more more interesting the stealing cattle is pretty obvious like you just steal the resources but like i think that native people just killing the cattle in that book is more interesting because it shows the significance that they understood um cattle to have for just the the viability of the settler colony So as far as Seattle history goes, a little bit after this, um, an important development came in 1854 when a number of tribes in uh, the Puget Sound area signed a treaty uh, 
with uh, the U.S. Uh, granting lands after you know years and years of conflict, um, as we talked about last week. And remember our context. So this is we're talking about 1854. This is right as right after the um, uh, the Cayuse War. This is right at the beginning of the um, Yakima Wars. Um, so remember, this is the uh, almost I wouldn't say peak. I, I don't want to necessarily make that argument, but this is a high point in in terms of uh, aggression towards towards native folks um, in the area. Um, but the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed um, by uh, the tribes that are are mentioned there, um, and this is a quote from that treaty, uh, denoting that for the purposes of the treaty, all of those different tribes were to be regarded as one nation, um, and they were acting as one body when they were signing the treaty um again just highlighting the uh sort of ignorance of the u.s government um to recognizing local differences uh between tribes which historic which me also uh means historical uh or ancestral homelands um different any sort of like historical conflict between groups is completely just absolved and and completely erased uh uh by in the manner in which the u.s approaches their negotiations with with native people um you know however uh these at the same time right they so the u.s puts all these tribes together as like you guys are just you guys are just um all from this area you're all native people you know you're just all one all one nation right um just completely uh erasing those those local distinctions but at the same time um the same tribes did band together and as one party refused to sign anything that didn't grant them uh fishing rights so in article three of the medicine creek treaty says the right of taking fish well, what they were guaranteed was the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds that's important obviously uh uh going forward that's an important um provision uh so right taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said indians in common with all citizens of the territory um that's going to be very very significant um in our next uh conversation in um, the present day and in the last, I mean, in the present day, but especially the last several decades, um, there's a lot of legal significance to that uh, provision that we'll be discussing. Um, so the Puget uh, Sound War from 1855 to 1856 began uh, after the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed. And after the creation of the Nisqually Reservation, uh, which did not include uh, consistent access to the river in which they had historically depended on fishing, you know, dependent on fishing, their reservation did not include consistent access to mainstays on the on the river for them. Um, so they got especially um, this deal was especially raw for the Nisqually. Um, so the chief of this tribe named Leshi, um, who is pictured there, um, led a native opposition to the Medicine Creek Treaty and the Yakima Treaty, which was um, in the context of the Yakima Wars, um, had a very similar sort of model to it um with just different uh native folks uh from from the eastern part of the washington oregon territories um but under under leshy uh he led you know Nate led this group um 
that had been included in the, the Medicine Creek Treaty uh, really let like that had refused to sign anything that didn't guarantee them fishing rights. Um, he led this group's opposition um, afterward to the sort of conditions that were created by the Medicine Creek Treaty. Um, so in 1856, uh, a confederation of tribes led by uh, the Nisqually attacked the city of Seattle. Um, it's called the Battle of Seattle. Um, this is a depiction I'm from 1890. I think this is a very like crude depiction. I mean, it's one, uh, it's like one building, but it's supposed to, and, and one ship in the background uh, that did actually fire on native people, which was um, how their attack was really broken was uh, the use of um, the use of a ship from uh, the, the coastline or the shoreline rather. Um, but regardless, it just shows that uh, several hundred native people uh, attacked uh, what was in the settlement of Seattle. Um, and there were only a few casualties, but uh, the the attack and the attack was was kind of easily like i said it was fairly easily broken by the use of of artillery um and um the which i think that um uh was aided by um the use of of local militia as well um but regardless the 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 significance of the attack is that it really sh showcase to settlers and also to the the provisional government in um in uh the Washington and Oregon territories that native people um were willing to attack a settlement and would and would would risk something like that um that really uh frightened um a lot of uh settlers there but also just it uh, caused further uh fears of a larger scale um uprising across if, in other words if these local differences um could be and any sort of squabbling between between um uh tribes would be could be um foregone uh and they could uh have some sort of general resistance formed against um settlers uh then that could spell uh huge problems for them um so that was sort of the fear that came out of this attack that you know oh man you know these are this is just a few hundred people that attacked and we were lucky enough to have a ship on the shoreline like you know um it, it caused a lot of uncertainties and fears, and it also heightened a lot of the aggressions towards Native people from there on out. Um, you know, however, uh, there's a few major acts in the, in the federal, we need to talk about the federal context here, I think, a little bit. There's a few major acts uh, that happened in this era that were key pieces of settler colonial legislation. Um, one was the Oregon Land Claims Act, which was 1850. This granted 320 acres of land to settlers in the Oregon Territory and in Washington under the condition that they would cultivate the land for four years. Um, another one, very similar uh, here about 12 years after, um, was the Homestead Act. And this um, applied to... Uh, pretty much a much larger uh, area in the West than just Oregon and Washington. Um, this was a much bigger effort uh, by the, by the U S government, but it, it guaranteed uh, 160 acres of quote unquote unimproved land. And it did apply to our, our area here uh, in the Washington territory as well. Um, and Remember what I talked about last week with um, the governments or the state's role in is paving the way for 
for settlers uh, to go and and make those claims, right? Uh, it's it's giving them the green light to go, and there's an anticipation, of course, that like that's gonna cause conflict, um, and that that would be further cause for the U.S. state to establish itself. Um, and so these are key pieces of legislation that that really made that happen. Um, and one of the biggest uh, and most consequential pieces of legislation for Native people just in general in history, um, but especially as far as our conversation with, with land rights goes, um, was the Dawes Severalty Act in 1887, which authorized the president of the U.S., um, to break up uh, tribal-owned lands um, that were hold, held um, by, you know, by a, by the community um, that were not individually owned pieces of private property. Uh, it authorized the president to break up those lands and then reallocate or redistribute them to those tribes, um, but as indivi those individually owned allotments. And and more than anything else, um, the Dawes Act was, uh, it, it basically just forced, it, it forced Native people um, out of the com the communal um, ways of living that were so central to day-to-day um, -day life, to cultural significance, to... Uh, or or cultural traditions um it, it wasn't this is the Dawes Act is a is a concerted effort to erase indigeneity in general as a as and this is what I I open the course with this um it, it's 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 not just to settle our colonialism is not just to and and is not just based on the elimination of native people as, as bodies it's based on the elimination or the co-optation of indigeneity as, as the cultural representation of being indigenous to an area. Um, and in, in this case, the America. Um, and part of that was, uh, and, and of course this goes into the conversation on, on, sovereignty over land of course too but i'm just i think i'm just emphasizing the the cultural represent or significance of this part um but by breaking up uh communal structures uh it's very concerted effort to and and forcing native folks on private property and to uh participate in wage labor Right to no longer are uh, that you're breaking up their ability to um, provide to 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 provide um, subsistence for themselves, um, and, and as part of a communal effort, right? Um, now that what the Dawes Act did was it forced Native folks um, to participate in the system where they have to sell their labor for a wage in order to buy the essentials that they need to survive whereas they previously had been able to secure those essentials um by communal means on communally owned uh lands um so this is one of the most uh you know just devastating pieces of legislation that that happened at the time Um, so uh, this is uh, a painting called uh, The Rocky Mountains, Immigrants Crossing the Plains. And like I said, this time, uh, this is the late 1800s at this point. Um, there's a guy named Frederick Jackson Turner. He's a historian famous for the frontier thesis, which you may have heard of. And um, he comes out, this is in, in uh, the... 1890s uh his frontier thesis which is a, a paper that he presented um basically said that the the u.s frontier is now closed 
um, we've we've colonized uh, and settled every area from coast to coast, and we've, especially in the context of what I just said with the with the Dawes Act, just eliminating tribal, you know, sovereignty. There's this. This is the beginning of the myth of what's called the, or this is the beginning of what's called the myth of the disappearing Indian. Um, it's a reference to a historical narrative or trope that's just once that you know that the U.S. goes out west, um, co you know, uh, conquers the the continent and native people and 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 just eliminates native people and that they're now just gone. Right. Um, this is what I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture as far as they disappear from the historical narrative at this point. You don't just in terms of learning about 20th century U.S. history, uh, Native people aren't part of the conversation, I, both in the secondary school uh, sense, but also in a popular history or just the way we think about 20th century history. Native people aren't part of of the conversation. Um, and that is a direct consequence of, of this, of, of this disappearing Indian, um, trope. Um, but the Turner thesis was more of like lamenting the loss of, of this, this life, you know, what, as, as I, this, you know, not that it was like all hunky dory. I mean, like, I mean, we talked about the Oregon trail uh, so Rocky Mountains, Ebinger, it's crossing the plains. This is the idyllic, I mean, this is important to understand. This is like the idyllic representation of the frontier as some, um, as, as a process and not just like a one place, right? Because the place doesn't always look like this, but there's this idea of a frontier as, as, an, as an ideal, as a, as a mythical sort of just uh, um, uh, 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 representation of pure freedom um, that existed in the minds of Americans. And this is an expression of it. And, and as we've talked about, this is not how it was for settlers, right? Like let's remove even native people from the conversation here for, for a minute, as far as their experience goes, like just being on this trail. Uh, I mean, I've been horrible. Like it's just getting like dysentery and getting sick and you get like one little cut, like you get a splinter on your, you're fixing your wagon wheel. You get a splinter and you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to die now. Cause I'm going to get an infection. Like that sucks. This is not an idyllic lifestyle uh, by any means. So I think the point there is that it, it, it doesn't matter. That's, that's how it's represented as like the, the ability to, Go cross country and establish yourself um, and establish your freedom is is so powerful in, in American lore. Um, and so the Turner thesis is kind of a, a, a lamentation uh, of a loss of that. But it, again, it's a loss of what? Um, there's this book called The End of the Myth um, that I read in uh, a seminar class that I, I really enjoyed. Um, I have some disagreements with it, but overall, I think it's a really, really interesting um, take on what we're talking about. Um, but what is the frontier? I mean, the, the, as far as this idea, um, this historian named Greg Grandin in this book, you know, argues that uh, there's all these tensions on the East Coast constantly, especially labor tensions, right? Um, fueled, this is in the late 18th century. This is fueled by um, immigration from, from Eastern Europe, uh, not even just Eastern Europe, but but Europe at large. Um, uh, fueled by immigration, you know, you there's the obvious uh, conflict of the fact that at this point, post uh, reconstruction, the South is just an apartheid state, right? It's 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 a it's completely run by white supremacy and uh, and and terrorism of of uh, of black folks. 
um, by, you know, by uh, white Southerners. I mean, that's just that's just what the South was at that point, right? So there's all these conflicts uh, that are happening in the East, and there's sort of just like this. It's conflicts and or in in a social sense is ubiquitous. Um, uh, is is Greg Granin's point. Um, and so he sort of flips the Turner thesis on its head to argue that the thesis itself, like this narrative of, of Turner's, like, you know, the, there's this frontier and now it's closed. It kind of reveals that expansion or settlement or, or conquest here is always acted as sort of a release valve um, from these tensions. The idea of having this sort of, uh, this this idyllic lifestyle this representation of pure freedom um in the minds of americans acted as a sort of like um uh, a pressure release for all of these unresolved conflicts um again interesting thesis i don't completely there's i, I could pick out issues that I have with it, but I think other, in general, I think it's an interesting and useful way to understand um, uh, how the frontier operated as a, as a ideological construction in American society. But what does, I mean, like we should ask, like there's a, they didn't own, you know, the U S didn't own Canada. There's, there's clear boundaries established now uh the late 1800s so now the u.s does establish itself pretty pretty uh handedly across the continent there really is no more like physical frontier for them like what is what is what what happens at that point i mean not to to go into like not to accept the turner logic but like there is a sort of closing of the of a physical space right um so what happens? And answer to that is we have to look internationally. And there's a book called uh, Fighting for American Man Manhood. This is getting outside the realm of this class a little bit, but it's by uh, Kristen Hoganson. Uh, it's really good. It's about just the centrality of gender politics um, in the Spanish-American War. What's depicted here is Teddy Roosevelt and the you know so-called Rough Riders, which is just the lamest name ever. I think this is so... That's so possibly cringy. Um, the Rough Riders here uh, go, you know, invading Cuba during the Spanish American War in 1898. And she talks about how this is at this point, you know, expansion and conquest. Uh, and this is Greg, Greg Grandin makes this point about the Spanish American War too, is that it's an exercise in the frontier, right? This is just, uh, there's no more physical frontier. So there's this huge cultural push for um, for international uh, colonialism um, to sort of join the European powers sort of thing. And Hoganson makes the point that this is just one big exercise in uh, masculinity and, and construction of, of, of masculinity. Um, this is one big gender affirming exercise in other way, in other words, um, which I think is a really, uh, interesting, um, an interesting way to think about this, but that is the context of, uh, the late 19th century U S settler colonialism. And, uh, it's also particularly characterized by the development and spread of scientific racism on a wider scale. So scientific racism sort of a uh a way of using um the then by then popularized sort of notions of evolution in a scientific or biological sense and of uh intrinsic of natural selection of uh intrinsic immutable gen of not genetic at that point but biological um, variations between species, um, sort of thinking about the world in in a scientific and biological sense, um, 
was obviously put to service of uh, white supremacy. Um, and scientific racism is sort of the application of the sort of like Darwinian logic. It's like a bastardization of it. I mean, like social Darwinism um, uh, is another sort of like product of this time uh, of like survival of the fittest. It means that um, we can explain all the inequalities in society based on that's just how the the more the fittest are just going to make it. And that's just how things are. So at this time, what I'm saying is that there's a um, concerted effort to to apply the sort of like authority of of authoritative sort of nature of of science of science and biology at this time to white supremacy and to justify um the sort of uh, constructions of race um and our story here i, I want to follow up on just the on captain jack um one thing i didn't mention last time but i realized it actually made more sense to save it for this um this is sort of the the scientific racism as applied to native people is also mixed with what I mentioned about the myth of the disappearing Indian. So there's like this effort at this time to understand or study in a scientific way, quote unquote, right? Uh, uh, native people as sort of like this lost uh, um, relic of the old West, you know, that they used to be here. And now they're sort of like this, like just like they would study, you know, like dinosaur bones or something. They're studying native people. Um, and after his execution, um, Ken Puash, uh, Captain Jack, was beheaded, um, which was fairly common Native folks then. Um, he was beheaded at, at Fort Klamath. And uh, in 1898, so the army, the army kept his, his remains for like 25 years or whatever, um, maybe 20 years or so. Um, and then in 1898, the army sent his remains to the Smithsonian. And why? Um, this this is to to the point I made about scientific racism is as he's quote unquote studying native people, and what the point here is is to talk about this is just like dehumanization, it's just pure dehumanization of native people, right? It's they're uh, they're products of the landscape of of um, the West and and this sort of like biological sense um the another way to think about this is like they're not as far as outlaws if there's like there's um execution of an outlaw in in the west they're not gonna there's not gonna be a beheading and their remains of like um you know some some famous outlaw i can't even think of right now but like they're not going to get sent to the Smithsonian. Why is it? Why is why are these um, people getting sent there, and why are their remains getting sent there? It's because they're just dehumanized and thought of as being fundamentally biologically different, um, and just not. And and the, that of course is just um, uh, an effect of the of just white supremacy uh, at this time. Um, and I think that that's just it's it's just a story that's emblematic of that. And here's the thing: what's really disturbing, and again, this is more common than um, it's more common than I think I ever grew up understanding. But um, just like these conversations about like the British Museum and like returning artifacts and like all this type of stuff, like there's just like this assumption um uh or i guess this is another way of thinking it's just like why do you guys still have all this stuff like how did you, how did you not to this point be like maybe we should return this um nothing happens um none of these institutions really give a shit uh, until they're like pressured by um you know pressured publicly really until like they might, their image might be harmed. 
And so the Smithsonian didn't return uh, Ken Puash's remains to the Modoc until the 1980s. So like almost 100 years later. Um, and it's only after his descendant family members found out, number one, which they weren't, they like found out by just somebody leaked it to them. Um, and then they filed an appeal and they made it a big deal, right? So they, they weren't ever going to return that. Smithsonian knew that they had this stuff. And um, I think that, again, this goes to say, like, these are the, the um, this is the, this is the institutions of, you know, the settler colonial institutions we talk about. And the, the fact that that is a strut, like part of the structure um, is sort of like just assumed um authority to 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 treat um to treat native people like that um so anyway this is the the federal context of of what's going on in the late 19th century as as far as where we go from here in our story of Seattle's development um but really uh as far as this time period, this is a really major, major developmental time period for for Seattle uh, after um, the big conflicts with, with Native people in the 1850s. Um, so as you can see there, 1870, there's about 1,200 people. There's not a lot of people in Seattle still. By 1896, that number grows a lot. Now, in those two years, the number doubles, and I think did the reading for last week, you know why, but we'll talk about it. And then by 1910, that number uh, over, you know, doubles, um, more than doubles, um, uh, and jumps by, what is that, like 150,000 people in a matter of like a little over 10 years. Um, so we're going to be talking about why that is. So it's really a function of two concurrent events and processes. Uh, the railroad construction and the Klondike gold rush, which you guys read about, and both were ecologically devastating. Um, so here's a representation of um, uh, one, what a like a a railroad would have looked like at this time period. So this is uh, the first trip of the Seattle and Walla Walla Railroad in 1877, um, and railroad construction was especially devastating. Uh, in order to lay those tracks over hilly and mountainous terrain it's a lot of you know, what american classic uh a dynamite was used um and uh damming uh the course of waterways uh completely changed the course um or not changed the course but altered the flow of um multiple rivers in in um uh the puget sound area um, it also clear clear cut forest as you can kind of see uh, a little bit. It's not just on the edges here, right? Like, in order to really m lay these tracks and to get all the equipment in there, um, and and have enough uh, and for camp and all that stuff, there's they're just clear cutting forests, right? And what that did was that worsened flooding uh, and increased sediment levels um, in in waterways as well. And so these were, this was a, um, we're going to talk about some of the effects of that, but that was a massively ecologically devastating process. But the railroads did facilitate a huge population growth and allowed for, for both goods and people to make their way from, um, from the East or from other parts of the West uh, to, to Seattle. Um, and this is also part of Richard White, who you read uh, The Organic Machine. He wrote this big book called Railroaded. Um, it's really good. It, it's probably my favorite Richard White book. He's written so much. That guy, I really legit don't understand how he had the time to do all those books. Um, but it's really good. It's it's probably the best book I've read on like the um, just the there's like the political history of railroads, like the economic history. The and there's so much environmental history stuff. As you know from Richard White reading that, he's an environmental historian too. Uh, it's just really, really good, highly recommended, but he talks a lot about this and that's kind of where I got this um, uh, from. But uh, the other process where that 
developed uh, sales population was, as you read um, in Catherine Morse's book, The Nature of Gold, was the Klondike Gold Rush. Um, so if we look on the map here for a moment, you can see starting in Seattle how the, what the number one routes would be. Um, so we, let's look at the Chilkoot uh route which was uh what what morse focused on the most and was the most popular route started seattle uh head up to vancouver and then make this pass or this uh this journey up the coast to skagway where they would land and then over this pass right here to all these gold fields and this was um the, the discovery of gold there, just as we talked about last week with gold, was a humongous driving force for for settlement. And the railroads made, you know, again, this happened concurrently. The demand for, for travel also increased the rate at which railroads were, were built. Um, and but both in, in, in tandem were, were really exploded the population of Seattle. But again, just like I mean, I'm not going to make the same point as I did last week on gold, but just remember how still like I remember our question about how would you explain gold to somebody or to an alien that had no idea or sense of the significance of it um uh outside of our like cultural or economic framework it, it, this would seem crazy like look at these guys like this looks these guys are in like five feet of snow just probably frostbit this guy has no he doesn't even have mittens on like he's gotta be so cold oh my god i can't even imagine but it's like why are you doing this um and again this is just it's just the prospect of um of striking it rich and that was enough to to drive forty thousand people to settle in seattle over two years and again that's not just that's just that's not all of the people that came out that's just the people that stayed in, in that settled in seattle over those years right um um so anyway um you may have been to seattle uh i've only actually ever been there once um i was there last year uh just kind of did the touristy stuff you know uh went to pike place and did all that but we walked around a fair amount and um uh, you know, if you've been there, uh, you'll probably know that it's very hilly and that um, I was, I guess, impressed on. I, I was just looking around like, how did they build these buildings to stay like this, like to be level number one and to uh, accommodate the um, or or to build like a like like public transit? Like, how did this how did they like? managed to do that and like do all the pavement and all of it um but this is how um so there's a massive regrading project um that happened in seattle uh in the early years right after this so it's you know seattle's population doubles uh it's and what happens when there's a demand like that there's okay seattle's the that's the hot place to be right what does that say economically that spells and if if you were to invest your money there, that could be in in real estate development or or some sort of commerce, that could be a big a big return on your money, right? That's what that signals. So there's this big effort to let's reshape the city literally, um, to increase the flow of goods, the flow of travel and people, um, because it is like difficult to navigate all of those hills um to get to uh the waterfront especially um so they underwent this massive regrading campaign um and again in order to this is another point where the in order to you know uh increase the flow of commerce in order to like there's a profit motive a profit incentive um and to which would further again to, this would further increase land speculation values this would this this project was just as much to increase the flow of traffic and and commerce and and goods 
as what as much as it was to increase that sort of like desirability for investment right it's like yeah look look at what we're doing to seattle like we're also making it uh we're also doing like putting all this money into making it this like um very modern place um and that itself was hopefully was was in hopes to uh to drive investment um now how did they do this this is the environmental history part that uh is fun to talk about because it's fascinating um so they used uh hydraulic mining techniques um and like i said everybody's american's favorite uh dynamite uh can't go anywhere without the dynamite i think uh in America, it seems. But this is what uh, hydraulic mining looks like. So they basically, these, these guys use, um, it was a design that was like popularized uh, after the, the gold rushes in the 1850s, uh, from my understanding. And it's basically used as a pressure system to uh, uh, just create a giant water cannon that that they could like you see this guy here I, I, my understanding is that this controls the pressure uh and you and like the tent you can control the tension there um but this hydraulic sluicing as it's called it's just it just they just blew away the mountainside with pressurized water that's it and dynamite and that's how they regraded all of this i mean these guys are having a hell of a time and also this footwear is interesting choice for for work day i don't know about i wouldn't even want to walk around seattle right now with these type of shoes um let alone this mess um but that is i mean that you can imagine um that this is not the not the the cleanest uh uh process and that there were probably some big environmental consequences of this one of them being by a race by uh blasting away the mountainsides just opened up um much more area and much more uh uh it, it increased the flow of sediment in erosion um you know from during rainstorms or something like that right and that really that affected um uh the the health of the ecological health of of waterways um it affected uh the it worsened flooding so what we'll talk about in a second is um some of the effects on the on the civilians that were living in the in seattle at this point um especially the poorest people there and so this is all to say that just there's a complete callousness with the, with which these uh these projects were done because there's no there was no checks like there's a lot of money to be made there's um again we can go i could go into this very more specific history of of um the sort of private public partnership with which this got done but i don't have so much time but uh essentially the point is that there's a there was a a profit to be made there's there's an economic uh incentive behind this project there weren't really any checks in place as far as like hey you guys it's illegal to uh to to do this technique that's gonna like put all the sediment in the river and screw it all up um so without those sort of checks you know this is just this is whatever the quickest and cheapest and way to do something that was the most effective uh was what was done and these are some more this is the more dramatic um uh, regrade that happened in uh, in uh, 1908 through 1912, uh, which is called Denny Hill. Um, and I mean, you can see, let's look on the left here. Uh, again, using the techniques that we said. Um, so this is like the Washington Hotel and Denny Hotel before the regrade. And then after um, the regrade in 1908. So you can see like how much this has changed um, based on just the efforts to just blast away this hillside. Um, and like, just like, look at, look at this, like this is all part of like a hill, you know, um, 
and you can imagine if it rains pretty hard as it as it tends to do sometimes in seattle uh that this is going to cause some issues um it's not the only thing that's going to cause issues but that's one of the most obvious ones um but i think that this was this is just i think a good representation of how dramatic um those efforts were so this uh all of this was comes from this book it's a great book it's called emerald city and environmental history of seattle um it's one of the best like what i said at the beginning of this lecture urban environmental history uh books that's out there um my advisor steve beta uh, will talk about his book in the next lecture but he uses um the this guy matthew klingle the author of this book uh my advisor Steve uses his um, or really bases his concept of place uh, as a concept uh, on Klingle and, and place is really just in short, like there's physical space. This is a physical space, but place is a concept of, of like the cultural significance or value that we attach to this place, right? Uh, this physical space. So, you know, one's physical space might be have do, do two different meanings of place for two different groups of people or something. You know what I mean? But it's a really great book. Um, I highly recommend uh, if you want to know more about this. Um, but all of this is to say that deforestation, railroad construction, and uh, these regrading projects cause periodic flooding and pollution on the banks of Duwamish River. Um, this made the real estate cheap and undesirable for investors in those areas. So what happens? Um, who is a who can afford to live there, right? Um, this area along the banks of the Duwamish became known as uh, Skid Row and was largely comprised of disenfranchised Native Americans uh, and immigrants. And those marginalized groups disproportionately experience the slow violence of environmental pollution. So like, you know, they're already pushed into um, by nature of racial exclusion and, um, and the like are pushed into um, impoverished areas. Um, and those impoverished areas become further impoverished because they're disproportionately um experiencing uh environmental catastrophe and which only for you know further worsened um the the value of the the land right um so essentially those uh, this is to say that the most impoverished people in in seattle who were native americans and largely Native Americans and, and immigrants um, at that time, uh, disproportionately um, were stuck in this cycle of, of experiencing environmental uh, catastrophe that was caused by um, caused by uh, uh, all of these, massive uh public works projects um in seattle and this is very emblematic of of the larger there's you know a couple other developments in seattle's history we can talk about like the sewage system or um uh different roads and and the like uh that had um other negative effects as well but the important takeaway here is that race and class shaped what's called the ecology of urban poverty uh, in Seattle at this time. Um, so one, like I said, we didn't talk too much about the sewage, but if you, as it may not surprise you to learn that they had shitty uh, sewage management as well, um, weren't the best at like covering their bases and making sure they implemented a safe and, uh, and um, a reliable sewage system. Um, that may shock you to learn based on what we just talked about, but uh, poor sewage management caused eutrophication in Green Lake, um, which is here. Um, 
I mean, this is what it looks like, but here on the map, you can see this is where Green Lake is in, you know, in relation to the bigger part of Seattle. Um, so uh, it, eutrophication means that it's too nutrient rich in nitrogen and phosphorus um, and uh, it becomes anoxic. Uh, and so it can't support wildlife and or uh, it's because it's called Green Lake, apparently, because uh, apparently there's algal blooms every year. Um, I didn't know that. It sounds kind of cool. Um, but it was named uh, Green Lake for that. Uh, but th this becoming uh, uh, or this eutrophication mean that it, it severely affected the algal blooms and Green Lake was iconic for the city's uh wealthy residents at the time and of course um uh they they you know they as as recreators they they enjoyed living near and and recreating at the lake right of course they blame the pollution on the lake um not on the sewage system or on what was actually going on but on the impoverished communities living near and around there um, and Green Lake was so iconic that demand for green spaces throughout the city grew afterward. Um, so in 1903, Seattle's urban planners contracted, uh, the two sons of this guy on the left, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, to construct green or to construct parks and green spaces throughout the city. So Olmsted, um, he was the guy that designed Central Park as well as in New York City, as well as a couple other famous places, uh, there. And so his two kids kind of took over the family business of designing parks um, and they were contracted to uh, go into Seattle and um, pretty much make Seattle into a green paradise, right? Um, not just restore Green Lake or to, or to make Green Lake a park, but to, this was a bigger call for, to, to, we want to make Seattle the big green space and have all these lovely parks around, right? Um, the problem is that construction of those parks displaced thousands of residents that were already living there. And um, there wasn't too much concern over displacing, um, as you can imagine. And so this is a representation of, of um, some of the different lakes that were, or lakes uh i'm looking at green lake here sorry <laughs> and lake union um some of the different parks uh that were proposed uh um at the time and that were eventually all constructed but this is like a contemporary sort of map um from then but you can see like all the little sort of like gray spaces throughout this map here i mean these aren't small areas and these are all at the time these weren't there right that's what i'm trying to show you um and so this is what they i just noticed this this is this is leshy park i want i i don't really know seattle that well so you may know this but i'm wondering if that's i literally am just seeing this now i wonder if that's named after our chief that we talked about earlier which would be really just that's just uh that's something huh um Anyway, you can the point here is that you can see that there's there's people living in all these places and um especially along here um in some of these areas um and along here in the Duwamish um there were uh already uh lots of communities that were fairly impoverished and so um that's that's one of the uh, biggest consequences of the development of the Seattle Park System is that it was built on displacing just thousands of people. Um, and this is pretty much emblematic. The broader point here is it's emblematic of the um, early history of the environmental, quote unquote, conservation movement. Um, this is an environmentalism, as we talk about in a more modern sense, but this is its predecessor. Um, and so communities living in poverty, particularly Native Americans, African Americans, and international immigrants were and, and still are often blamed as the cause of urban pollution, even though they were disproportionately experiencing the effects of it. Um, the real cause of those problems, the profit motive behind unchecked industrial production, 
like we talked about, you know, the real estate interests that are at hand uh, are all of those causes of those things of those of that pollution that sort of just callousness with which with which um uh development or, or construction is is um approached as as we talked about when there's just no checks um all of the real causes of those problems is abstracted when um uh, in the minds of people that are are living there right they don't or when they don't see that sometimes um physically don't see the railroad construction in the countryside it becomes sort of abstracted and the conditions that it creates all this pollution are only then interpreted as being further cause for division on race and class lines and you know so this is the main takeaway from this that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. The tension between environmentalism and a Native American, you know, environmentalism in quotes here, because this is not, it's conservation, uh, which we don't have too much time to go into the differences between, but it's just an important to understand as the predecessor for environmentalism. But this tension between that and, and Native American land use rights um, have their foundations in what's called the progressive era, ironically enough. Um, to answer our questions from earlier, um, how did Seattle grow? Uh, Seattle grew in this year as a function of five major processes. Well, I, I kind of count as five. So number one, ending Native American sovereignty. Number two, railroad construction. Number three, the gold rush. And again, those two things happen in tandem. Number four, those big regrading projects. And five, um, also in tandem with, with uh, all of it, really, were real estate interests. Um, so again, just to say the profit motive, um, how do Native people experience living in urban Seattle? And um, and basically we'll just how did Native people uh, experience this time period? U.S. settlers dispossessed Native people of their lands, deprived them of tribal status. We talked about Dawes Act. Um, and all of these, uh, all of these other uh, development projects um as well as i should have written there too uh is obviously uh aiding this but all of that forced many into into living in urban poverty which was then obviously worsened by the conditions that were put on them um the th and our third question is how should we should think about the relationship between urban development and rural uh environmental change um I think this is a more interesting point, but I think the real true ecological cost of development, where we're talking about rail, you know, clear cutting forests for railroads. If you live in the city, um, you know, you may see that you might have probably saw the regrading projects, but if you live in the city, you're not seeing that. Um, so you just see like people flowing into the city and you see the city getting built and you're like, oh, you like, you're like, well, what's the, you don't see any of the sort of like, real costs or um what went into making all of that possible um you just see this is a theme in in urban history um i should have recommended a couple more books here but i'm sure you, you have I'm sure you, that you, that's all you want to do uh, going into the new term is is take a bunch of my book recommendations um but there's a bunch of other books that are in urban environmental history that make this point that at the point of consumption, right, uh, if you're living in the city and you go and you turn on your air conditioning, you know, you're not seeing all of the and the development uh, and the ecological cost of the energy development um, that went into or or of just like making your air conditioner or the labor that went into making your air conditioner, all of that at the point of you consuming that air conditioner uh, is not, you know, it's not visible, it's abstracted. And so ecological costs of this urban sort of rural uh, divide, it's, it, it's very, operates very similar way that we should think about them as happening as being interrelated um, and part of why we talk about um, or we think about, you know, ecological change as a rural sense, really, um, and then maybe in an urban sense as being two separate stories is actually a function of this 
abstraction that happens. So I think our point here is to really, on, on talking about Seattle, is to understand that those things happen in tandem and that we should understand environmental change uh, in the urban sense as being no as being uh, no different than and being reliant upon ecological change in the rural or hinterlands. Um, and I think that's it for today. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, for uh, for listening in. Um, we'll pick up from this and talking about uh, the termination era and uh, and talking about uh, AIM, uh, the American Indian Movement. Um, uh, and then we'll conclude the class uh, with talking a little bit about uh, the Klamath and about uh, environmentalism. So excited. Um, thanks, everybody. I uh, hope you have a great day. Bye bye.